What we have here is a Smith & Wesson Model 10, a snubby. Six shots. Accurate, or even a snubby. K-frame size, so you've got the weight to absorb recoil. It's fairly easy to conceal as well. Since we are going to be talking about capacity today, I thought it would be a good gun to bring out and do some shooting with. These are the first two. And right there was my headshot. These were the second two. And then this one I got off. There's the second shot. All right, I put two here. Got that one a little low. And I put two here. And I got all fumbly fingers on my reload. It's Greg with Lion Quest Fitness. Come on, have a sit down on my front porch and let's talk about capacity. But before we start, let me let you take a look at uh, this beautiful piece of hardware again. I call it my Joe Friday special because old Detective Sergeant Joe Friday on the TV show Dragnet from the 1960s and early 70s, that's what he carried. Now we're going to talk about capacity today. And because of recent events and we'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of this video you know it made me re-examine as to how many rounds i carry and why i carry and normally i carry a five shot revolver because it's easy to conceal it goes with me where a lot of other firearms cannot go with me we'll talk some more about that toward the end so where I want to go, I want to start with a gentleman by the name of Claude Werner, who is, who is an expert, you know, former military, former law enforcement. Uh, he's been a trainer for many, many, many years. He has a website called The Tactical Professor that uh, has a lot of good information. And, and let me say this as well. 
I carry both semi-autos and revolvers. I'm not either or. They both have advantages and disadvantages. So don't think this is just a video to try to say that somehow revolvers are superior to semi-autos because they're not. But for the individual person, they both have their place. Now in 2001, Claude Warner came out with a study that he made based on the Armed Citizen column of uh, the, the National Rifle Association's publications. Now, these were all positive outcomes. Remember this, all right? So this information might not be entirely correct, and we're gonna talk about that. All right, he took uh, 482 instances for ordinary citizens, not police officers, but ordinary citizens, had to defend themselves with a firearm. Now, there were some interesting numbers that came out of this study. Uh, number one, 52% of these self-defense situations occurred in the home. Uh, one thing that is very surprising is that the average and median number of shots fired was two. Only 20% of these situations did the uh, person attacked actually had the gun on their person but they did have a gun available that they could get to. Now, this is a biggie right here. Out of those 482 times, uh, there was only three times where the gun had to be reloaded. And one of those times dealt with uh, a person trying to take down an escaped lion. Now this one, I, I, had, I wish I knew the backstory on this one, but an escaped lion that they were trying to take down with a 32 caliber pistol and they shot it 13 times before it poor old lion finally gave up the ghost now 36 percent of the incidents had two or more assailants and usually two sometimes three but usually the third person was the getaway person you know in the getaway car and they did not try to join in on the fight and one of the interesting things is that it was a swarm rather than seconds. It was more of a shark-like attack where the predators would try to swarm their, their victim. And I found that very interesting. Now I have seen that and what it, the way it plays out is whoever they're they're feeling out that victim that's why one's coming here and one's coming there they're surrounding that victim before they jump in and attack now out of claude's study he came up with uh, six six things and first off you know awareness is key to surviving any time type of deadly assault you know be aware also, have the mindset to be willing to fight. Have a weapon accessible. Now, I carry 24-7, except where I go into places that it's prohibited by law for me to carry. All right? Uh, but I do keep a fire, my firearm, if I have to take it off, it's stored in my vehicle temporarily. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Be familiar with your weapon. You know, I don't carry a weapon until I, I've shot it a good bit. Usually, uh, for me to get a good feel to a gun over time, not, not on a day trip to the range, but over time, I will have shot that gun, you know, 300 to 500 times to get a good feel for it. Now, this was a, a key point that we tend to overlook. You know, in all these cases that were successful, or in most of them, they verbalized their resistance. You know, stop, get back, I'm armed. Um, and, and they verbalized their willingness to not be a victim. And then last but not least, if they keep coming, counter without hesitation. 
Now, the big takeaway here in, in this 462 self-defense uh, shootings, the average was two shots. The median number of rounds fired was two shots. Now you might say, well, this was almost 20 years, over 20 years ago, and that's true. And you may also say that uh, this, it, this was cherry picked, that these were all positive outcomes in each of these cases. And that's also true. So what Claude did was he also started studying uh, incidents where there was a negative outcome. And we're gonna talk about that as well. A lot of people would think, okay, it has to do with tactics. It has to do with not having high capacity. And, and let me tell you, one of the reasons that Glocks became so popular was that they capitalized on an incident in New York City where a police officer uh, stopped to reload his revolver and was gunned down by a criminal. And that, that, they played that up a good bit back in the, uh, in the late 80s, mid 80s. And, you know, it's very interesting, and this is gonna be a, another video where we talk about the rise of the Glock. Now, I'm not against Glocks. They're very good guns, simple manual of arms, simple to maintain. That's one of the reasons they're so popular with law enforcement. They're simple to train large groups of people on. So, but we're gonna talk about that in another video. But let's look at these negative outcomes. Number one, brandishing or threatening with a gun. You never wanna do that. Now, what negative outcome could that could happen from that. Well, number one, you could get criminally charged because in most states, if you brandish or present a weapon without just cause, you could be criminally charged. But also, it, there's, there may be an indication there that you're not serious about fighting, that you're just trying to scare that person. Now, let me also say this. You know, out of the uh, hundreds of thousands of self-defense uses of a firearm in this country every single year, it's hundreds of thousands, and that might be a low, a low estimate. But out of all those, major by far the vast, vast majority of those, the gun is never fired. It's the presentation of that firearm with the intent to use that stops that attack. All right, now here's another big chasing after the end of the confrontation. You never want to chase a suspect. Once you have stopped that attack, you back up and prepare to be a good witness. Number three, shooting an innocent bystander. Once again, you're responsible for every round that goes out of that gun. And uh, that's why you need to practice using that firearm. You also need to be aware of what's around you and what's behind that person you're trying to stop. All right, intervention. Be careful of what you step into. If you see some type of confrontation or some type of situation, do not rush in. You're not a police officer. You're not trained to be a police officer. Stop. Call 911. Record information. Be a good witness. Now, lost and stolen guns. That's another negative outcome. That's why I do not keep a firearm, you know, a truck gun, a car gun. I don't do that. Because I don't want to run the risk of one of my vehicles being broken into and a gun being stolen. The only time I keep a gun in my vehicle is when I am in some type of government building where firearms are, are prohibited by law. And that's only temporary. Other than that, that gun is on my side till time for me to go to bed or to take a shower and then it's somewhere at close access. All right, negligent discharges. Now that's another big 
and no one wants to admit that they've ever had a negligent discharge, but it happens. And it happens most frequently with striker fired handguns without a safety and you can't get around that. All right, police involvement where you are the one who is arrested. He's got that list too. That's definitely a negative outcome. Uh, unauthorized access, a child, a teenager, or some other person getting hold of that firearm. Unjustified shootings. And this includes warning shots. You never, never do a warning shot. And the one thing that seems to not be here is the so-called very few tactical failures. And the one thing that comes into play as far as those things that were tactical failures is not having a gun accessible when you needed it. And that's where I want to segue into these incidents with the, uh, the mass shootings. Now, statistically, they are still extremely rare, and we have to remember that fact. However, to ordinary citizens, it's very frightening thinking that, you know, I could go uh, to my local Walmart, or I can be sitting in church, or I can be at a concert, and some nutcase is going to come in and start shooting the place up, either as a terrorist, or in the name of whatever religion they serve or just be some antisocial, asocial person who wants to commit suicide and kill other people before he does. All right, it's a fear. Now, once again, let's go back to carrying the gun you carry, the gun you have. It's hard sometimes to carry a full-size handgun. And you're not going to have access. You know, I have, I, have, I hear people say, uh, well, my handgun's there just to fight my way to my battle rifle. Well, you know, I got one too, dude. But you might have a hard time getting to it if you, if you really need it. And that's where I go to what they call an always gun. A gun that you can always have with you. Now that's not to say there's a time and place for other types of firearms. A lot of it depends on where you live, the types of crime you could face, you know, how dangerous of it. There's certain areas of this country, I, you know, I'm carrying a high capacity semi-auto, you know, maybe more than one, you know. But in most places, you're not going to need that. You're not going to, you know, I'm a law-abiding citizen. You know, I'm careful about where I go, where I travel, the places I visit. You know, I don't drink alcohol. You know, I don't go to bars. I don't look for trouble. You know, always remember that. You can stay away from trouble. It doesn't have to find you. Regardless, an always gun is one that's small enough and concealable enough that you can carry it just about anywhere. Even like this time of year, you know, where I'm, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt a lot of times. You know, I often carry a uh, airweight J-frame Smith & Wesson revolver at 642. Now, I don't particularly like carrying it. I prefer carrying a steel gun that I can shoot plus P ammo out of and hit my target. But sometimes it's a necessary evil. Now, as far as the possibility of, of some maniac, you know, trying to commit some type of mass shooting. Always remember, defensive firearm, get behind cover if you can, get behind concealment if you can. If you have to act, you know, you need to do, you're not going to stand up square and face that guy <laughs> eye to eye and probably die in the process. Get behind cover. Get behind concealment. Now, is five shots enough? I don't know. You're going to have to be the judge of that. You know, I do know there was a, a church massacre in South Africa back in the 90s where four terrorists armed with 
automatic rifles and different types of bombs and explosive devices were going to take out a large church. There was one young man there had a five shot revolver. He returned fire and that stopped the attack. Now, is, would that happen every time? I don't know. But people who were on that suicide bent, they're not, and it's a strange, strange psychology there. But they don't, even though they may ultimately kill themselves, you know, they're not there expecting someone to fight back. You know, they're there looking for victims, looking for shock. You know, it's a control thing. They're getting that vicarious thrill of seeing the fear of their victims. And you're taking that away from them. And it interrupts their thought processes. So smarter people than me have covered this and gone over this. All right. So to recap, how many rounds do you need? Well, be prepared. I always carry extra rounds. If I can, you know, I'm carrying something possibly with more rounds if the place I go calls for it, right? But if you have to carry a, a small gun, a concealable gun, a five-shot revolver, train with it. Get good at it. That's why I shoot from 20 yards and 25 yards. You know, I may have to make a shot from a distance with that little air weight J frame. So this is Greg with Lion Quest Fitness reminding you to always be prepared for the unexpected.